This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to a special episode of the Rational Reminder Podcast. We thought it was a good idea to to do uh, a, a, a special release episode, kind of outside of our normal cadence, just to talk a little bit about the or address, not talk about, uh, but address the situation in in Ukraine. Um, and we're not giving any political commentary or, or anything like that. That's not our area of expertise, but we thought that what we could do is, as the name of our podcast suggests, uh, provide a bit of a rational reminder and the type of empirical data that we usually speak to to help people process um, from at least one perspective the things that are going on. And we also want to be clear up front that War is clearly a humanitarian tragedy, first and foremost, and we don't want to minimize that by talking about the potential uh, financial market impact, but financial markets are what we talk about. So that's the perspective that we're going to provide in this episode. And some people have reached out to us to ask us like, what sort of research is there around this to help them make decisions. So we're seeking to, to help answer that question. And for the record, we are recording this on Saturday, the 26th of February. So things are very dynamic and fluid, but to give you a sense of the timing. Yeah. All right. So the the idea here is that we, we want to talk a little bit about the data uh, with respect to financial markets in historical periods of war and, and political crises and things like that. Uh, it's kind of the the idea of pe- people panic because this time always feels different. Uh, so we just want to give context for how how different is this time from the perspective of financial markets, of course, um, not speaking to the uh, human tragedy, which is is certainly different. Uh, okay, so w- wars and financial markets have coexisted and often been intertwined for hundreds of years. I mean, go, the two go back together. Um, for for a very very long time, documented mm-hmm. for a very long time, probably even longer than what we have documented. Uh, countries that have lost major wars have had their financial markets completely decimated. Um, but global markets, even when those periods have happened for losing countries, global markets have been relatively resilient, even to major conflicts. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about how how resilient in, in the data in a minute. Uh, now, despite the, the relative resilience of global markets compared to individual country markets, wars do tend to reduce returns to global stocks and also increase their volatility. So we've seen a bit of that. I mean, Cameron, you mentioned the date. We've seen some decreases in prices, but we've also seen some uh, almost paradoxical <laughs> increases in, in market indexes in the last couple of days. Shocking market movements. Yeah. Well, that's the volatility, was, I guess. But Thursday was one of the greatest turnarounds, I think, ever in some different indices. And then again, Friday was a, a very dramatic up day, which I'm not sure many people had that forecasted on Wednesday. Right. Uh, so some of the most extreme historical stock and bond market returns, both positive and negative, and, and some of the most extreme, but not actually the most extreme. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, in, in a bit, but they've been connected to or, or concentrated around wars, major wars. Uh, but I think that drawing predictive conclusions from that, thinking, oh, there's a war or, or there's a major conflict that could get worse, therefore stocks are going to drop. I mean, we saw a single day example that you just mentioned, Cameron, but even in the aggregate data, that's not necessarily true. And uh, some of the research that, that we'll talk about shows that between the First World War and the Second World War, uh, people uh, thought that they had learned lessons from the First World War and tried to reallocate their portfolios. The, the First World War is quite quite interesting from a financial markets perspective. There was a big liquidity crisis when the war began, um, probably because people had people didn't know what was going to happen. N- Neil Ferguson has a, a paper on this, and he uh, look, looks at a bunch of data uh, and historical accounts. Neil Ferguson's a historian. Um, although he sounds like an economist, he kind of has both, both perspectives, but world war one was a surprise. He, he, 
based on the historical accounts and the financial market data that he had uh, in the paper, he, he basically shows World One. Nobody expected it to happen. Uh, when it did, markets dropped. World War One was rough for financial markets. And then when World War Two happened, people tried to reposition their portfolios, but ended up losing out because stocks in the UK and the US actually appreciated during World War Two. For, for a local UK investor, for a US investor in UK stocks, World War II was actually negative. Anyway, we'll get more into that data in, uh, in a second. Now, wh- why do people worry about situations like this? Well, there are, like I mentioned, some really extreme events uh, that, that center around wars. The, the two most extreme cases, at least from the perspective of, of market returns, is the Ruff- Russian Revolution in 1917. Uh, where investors lost everything, Clo- close to everything. I mean, Russian bonds continued to trade after the revolution, but steadily decrease in value. So like in the mm-hmm. Dimson Staunton data, they zero it out after 1917. Uh, and likewise, in the Chinese Civil War, which ended in 1949, in both of those cases, the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Civil War, investors' assets were expropriated. Um, so the, safe to assume 100% losses for investors in those countries. So that, that is genuinely scary. Uh, a, a very interesting point that I came across while looking through that data is that if you had been investing in the companies listed on the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange from 1865 to 1917, so prior to the Russian Revolution, you substantially outperformed if you, uh, having invested stock in, in the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. So from wow. 1865 to 1917, you had about twice as much ending wealth investing in the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange as the NYSE. Crazy, right? Mm-hmm. And then, of, of course, that changed in, a, in the snap of a finger in 1917 when uh, assets were expropriated. So, I mean, I look at that and, and you think about the, the historical U.S. experience. I mean, we've talked about this many times. On, on the podcast, but people look at the U.S. market and think, you know, it, it's got the best historical returns, therefore that's where you should invest. But, I mean, just an example like that shows, who, who knows if the, I mean, of course it's a big if, but if the Russian Revolution had not happened and their stock exchange had continued on the pace it was going, maybe we, we wouldn't be looking at the, at the U.S. Right. Interesting. And the U.S. hasn't had, like, when you, the examples that we're going to talk about, countries on the losing end of wars, Countries with revolutions like China and the Civil War, or uh, revolution in, in Russia and the Civil War in China, where assets go to zero. The U.S. has not had any cases like that, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't. So it's just kind of a, it's, it's an important historical lesson, I think. Anyway, uh, so German stocks uh, during and after World War One. So I looked at the period 1914 to 1922. German stocks lost more than 90% of their real value measured in U.S. dollars during the war. So not the few years after they really got crushed, but during the war, German stocks dropped by 67% cumulative over the, over the period. Uh, U.S. and U.K. investors also lost in World War I, not, not as bad as Germany. U.S. stock investors lost 18% in real terms. Uh, investors in the U.K. lost 17% measured in USD, uh, and that was buoyed by an appreciation in the pound relative to the dollar. A local UK investor in World War I lost 36% in real terms. Uh, Japan had a a big increase in the value of their stock market during World War I, 1914 to 1918. They gained a real 63% cumulative in US dollars. Mm. And the world index over that 1914 to 18 period lost 31% real in US dollars. So pretty bad, pretty bad. Um, Germany was hit again with big losses after, during and after World War II. Uh, They dropped, the the stock market dropped by more than 90% from 1939 to 1947. Japan was even worse. Their stock market lost nearly 99% of its real USD value during and after World War II. Wow. Substantial. it's pretty it's pretty least. crazy, and yeah. again, like you, you think the, the think of the the human tragedy in in both of those cases. Um, I mean, it almost it feels bad just talking about the financial market aspect, but yeah. anyway, that's that's what we're talking about. Uh, in, investors in uh, 
US and UK stocks, this is the point I mentioned earlier, who, who tried to learn from World War I by getting out of stocks before the war, because I guess World War II was uh, maybe easier to spot than World War I, at least based on what I read from Neil Ferguson. Uh, so investors tried to reposition, and they ended, out, ended up losing out on positive real returns with the US delivering 22% real and the UK 34% real cumulative in their respective currencies during World War II. Measured in USD, UK stocks actually lost over that period. But local US and, and UK investors um, had positive real returns over, through the course of World War II uh, and, and after. Uh, a global equity investor through World War II lost about 15% real measured in USD. Now exposure to multiple risk premiums paid off a, a lot over this period. I didn't have these data for World War I, but for World War II, U.S. small cap value stocks beat the U.S. market by an annualized, so this is per year, right? the other numbers I was talking about were cumulative, this is per year, 12% from 1939 to 1947. And U.S. value stocks beat the U.S. market by 6% per year over the same period. So some pretty big premiums there. Uh, mm -hmm. In the paper I mentioned from Neil Ferguson, yeah, I got a quote from him here. He says, in short, there is no simple recurrent pattern. Investors did try to learn from history in the late 1930s, but they mainly learned how to make new mistakes since the lessons of the previous war proved to have only limited relevance to the next one. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty powerful, but it's also not really new. I mean, it's in the context of war, it's different, I guess. Uh, it's a, a, a different way to think about the whole the, the situation, but finan financial markets are inherently uncertain, random, and hard to, to learn from. Like we, we know that. Why would it be different from wars? Well, it's, it's not. Um, now, on average though, so you, you can't use knowledge of war to predict which assets are gonna do well. Um, but on average, it, it is true that there, are, that there there is a decline in markets during times of war or crisis. Um, which which makes sense. I mean, we, we know stock prices theoretically reflect the present value of expected cash flows discounted at a rate that is reflective of risk. If times of war decrease expected cash flows or increase risk, which are both more than plausible during times of war, uh, drops in prices are to be expected. Now, what's the other side of that coin? Uh, well, expected returns increase if the discount rate goes through the roof and therefore prices fall. That also means the discount rate goes up and expected returns also go up. And again, it feels bad talking about this, but uh, like we mentioned, this is this is what we're here to talk about. It just feels weird to talk about, you know, oh, look, how, look at the returns you could have had investing in Japan after World War II. Um, anyway, uh, so in, in the years following uh, the Second World War, so just looking at 1949 to 59, the German stock market increased at a rate of 61% per year adjusted for inflation in USD. That's, a, that's big, um, and that's real in, in, in USD. Uh, an investor who got into the German market in 1939 had lost nearly everything by 1947, uh, but if they'd stayed invested and maintained the ownership of their property, which I'm, I'm sure was messy, messy or, or at least interesting. Uh, they, they nearly tripled their initial investment by 1952. Wow. Uh, Japanese stocks appreciated at 28% per year from 1949 to 59. But the losses in Japan, remember they, they lost 99% of the value of the stock market in that case. They were severe enough that it took another 10 years until 1969 just to recover the, the real purchasing power of a dollar that had been invested in 1939. Incredible. Now, that, that was bad. I mean, the German case ended up, for, for investors, being, being not so bad, but um, Japan, a little, little tougher. Now, to, to, to contrast that experience uh, of, of Japanese and German investors, a globally diversified investor, ha had that been you know, practical at the time, which it, it wasn't, um, but if you had a, you know, VT, global, global uh, market index, index fund, uh, you lost about 15% in real terms measured in USD throughout the course of, of the Second World War. Um, so not, 
not nearly as volatile as, uh, as the other cases. And you matched the ending wealth. Um, by the end of 1959, the world market in Germany looked pretty similar in terms of their total returns. So, so th those are extreme events, um, deep in the left tails of, of stock market history and of, of human history uh, as well. But I think it's also useful to take a broader perspective because that so far is kind of anecdotal with just a couple of major examples. Uh, there's a 2006 paper, War, Peace, and Stock Markets. Uh, they looked at 440 international political crises over the period 1918 to 2002. And uh, they got the crises from the International Crises Crisis Behavior Database, which is from uh, it's, it's from Duke University. It's quite quite uh, interesting. Uh, it's all online. Uh, based on those data, on average, an international political crisis starts almost once every two months. Wow! Not generally as extreme as what we're seeing now, no. uh, obviously, but crises are not infrequent. Uh, the authors of this paper, they find that international crises reduce world stock market returns by approximately 4% per year. They f and that's that's just in the returns. Like the re you look at historical returns, well, they're 4% lower per year because of international crises. Um, they find large negative stock market reactions from world markets in the, in the first month of a crisis, followed by lower than average returns during the remaining months and a partial recovery when they when they end. Uh, the reaction from stock prices that they find in this paper is stronger when a crisis involves basic values like a territorial threat, a threat of grave damage, or a threat to existence. And reactions are also stronger when a superpower is involved on both sides of the conflict and when the conflict starts with violence. You can see a lot of those traits in what we're seeing now. Um, Confirming that we have confirming what we have seen anecdotally at the extremes, like we talked about the World War One and Two examples, um, this paper shows that investors in stock markets of countries involved in an international crisis see their markets drop about two percent. So the countries involved see their markets drop about two percent when the crisis starts, and then an additional one percent per month as long as the crisis lasts, on on average, of course, hmm. in, in the full sample. Um. And in, in, in the case of countries involved in the crisis, th this part was very important. Those losses are only partially recovered when the crisis ends on average. Hmm. And, I, you know, again, weirdness of, of, of talking about this stuff um, from a financial markets perspective. Uh, I, I've seen some people in, in the rational mind community, actually, somebody made a post of, you know, look at, look at the relative price of Russian stocks right now. What a deal. And it's like, that feels kind of gross to talk about. Um, but I actually responded with, with this quote from this paper that, listen, that's fine. But um, historically, if you look at past crises, the countries that are involved don't, on average, fully recover the initial losses that they sustain. So I don't know if it makes sense to look at the Russian stock market and say, what a deal. I don't know if it makes sense to, to, to do that morally, but, <laughs> but also from a pure uh, expected returns perspective. You wonder if globalization has a dramatic impact on this data going forward. Yeah, I mean, globalization, but also, uh, well, globalization of the financial markets and e easier access to the world index, right? Like may maybe the historical diversification benefits that, that we're talking about and we'll continue to talk about, uh, maybe they're overstated because um, markets were not integrated historically and they're more integrated now. So it's a, it's a good question and it's an open question. But I mean, at the same time, you look at what's happened to the Russian stock market recently, and you look what happened to the world market over the same period. Well, that looks a whole lot like the data we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, true. Right now. Um, international crises have a strong impact both on average returns and on volatility, with volatility increasing by slightly more than a third compared to its average at the onset of a crisis, and then decreasing by slightly less than a third when the crisis ends. The authors of the paper suggest that political uncertainty may help explain the volatility puzzle. That's a famous 1989 paper by Schwert. I don't know if I said that name well. Um, but they, they, they pose this question of why, why does the volatility of the stock market change so much over time? And the authors of this paper suggest that part of the reason can be these, these um, consistent political crises through time. <clears throat> through time. Uh, okay, so we've, we've seen that stock markets do tend to react negatively to political crises, and in particular to, to wars. Uh, 
uh, bond markets, and this is a this is a tricky piece um, because bonds are typically the safe assets in a portfolio. Bond markets have done even worse, um, which kind of flips that conventional wisdom on its head a little bit, at least in the historical data. Uh, over the last 121 years, five countries have experienced negative real bond returns for the full period, where no country has had negative real stock returns for the full full period. Um, and those negative real long-term bond returns are largely associated with with wars and their aftermath in the in the first half of the 1900s. Um, German bonds lost all of their value during the hyperinflationary period of 1922 to 23. Uh, even the U.S. bond market has had major periods of long-term underperformance in and around wartime. Uh, starting in December 1940, U.S. long-term bonds, uh, government bonds, lost 67% of their real value and did not recover in real terms until 1991. Right? Pretty Incredible. scary. Uh, similarly, U.K. long-term government bonds started dropping in October 1946 lost 70, 74% of their real value by December 1974. So really just a slow, steady decline because that's a, that's a cumulative number. And again, they didn't recover fully until December 1993. Now, my point there is not a cautionary tale about, you know, don't own bonds. Um, I think it's just a reminder that diversifying across stocks and bonds and maybe diversifying bonds globally uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, US and UK stocks had positive real returns over the same period where those uh, bond markets had big negative returns. Uh, stocks and bonds have historically been imperfectly correlated. And even though um, bonds have had big drawdowns over some time periods, they're still generally less volatile than stocks. Um, but it's, it's, it's a reminder, I guess, that even though, even though bonds are generally less volatile than stocks, they are not necessarily a safe asset in real terms over long periods of time. And in the historical data, a lot of those big drawdowns and big negative real returns over long periods of time have started with, with uh, wars. So I don't know. The, the idea of panicking, getting out of stocks and going into bonds, for example, maybe doesn't sound, uh, maybe doesn't sound so good, at least not in the historical data. Although a 60-40 portfolio performed quite similarly to stocks, um, I guess because of the rebalancing over those historical periods where bonds did quite poorly. So it's not like the 60-40 portfolio didn't work just because bonds had uh, negative real returns. It still had less volatile returns than a 100% stock portfolio, just not as good as returns would have been if bonds had been like they have been for the last 30 or so years. Uh, okay, so... Wars can be devastating, particularly for the individual countries on the losing end. Uh, but this might be the most important point for the, of, the, of this whole segment. I, I think investors have to understand that the worst historical global stock market returns have occurred in peacetime. And those peacetime crashes have occurred more frequently than major wars or than, than market declines associated with major wars. So we mentioned global stocks lost 31% in real terms in World War I, uh, 12 or 15% in World War, I think it's 15% in, in World War II, but they lost 54% in the Wall Street crash of 1929, 47% in the 1973 oil shock and recession, 44% in the 2000 internet bust, 41% in the global financial crisis in 2008. So you look at that data and it's like, if you're, panicking about market volatility because of a war. Maybe it shouldn't have been in stocks in the first place because war, war, war is not what causes markets or not what causes the worst cases of market volatility and drawdown. Exactly. So if a war is your, your tipping point, well, the, the, you're probably in too aggressive of a portfolio in the first place right. because the, the, the worst declines that you can expect are not associated with, exactly with war. So you're, yeah, maybe, maybe another one of those reasons to revisit asset allocation. Um, but in terms of worrying about market declines, wars are at least historically not the biggest risk factor. It's been financial crises uh, and, and recessions that, dr that has driven most of that. 
uh, the, the, the last big lesson to remember is that while stock returns have been volatile throughout history, they have been reliably positive in the long run. And for a globally diversified investor, the ride's been relatively stable compared to investors concentrated in individual countries. Um, global stocks have returned a real uh, inflation adjusted 5.2% in, uh, in historical data going back 121 years. Inflation over that period has been about 3% in Canada and the US, so call it an 8% nominal return, 8% per year on average, which is huge. That's higher than what we expect in our, in our current financial planning expected return assumptions. And that return is despite two large-scale global wars, the Cold War, multiple civil wars around the world, revolutions, uh, economic depressions, and pandemics including the current one. Uh, in total, there are 487 political crises in that, in that database that I mentioned earlier from 1918 to 2017. The, the database has been updated since that paper was, was written. So 487 crises, um, not to mention all the other crazy stuff that goes on in the world, and here we are. Here we are, and, and market returns have looked just fine. Um, now, a, a common response that I hear to long-term data like that is, well, I don't have 121 years. You know, I, I need my portfolio to maintain its value now. Um, well, if you, if you need a portfolio to maintain its purchasing power at all times, then you should be in cash or, or GICs. Um, but I think it's important to remember that diversification between stocks and bonds and across countries and exposure to multiple sources of expected return, like the small cap and value that I mentioned earlier, has dramatically dampened volatility, reduced the magnitude of the most extreme drawdowns, and increased the recovery time after crises. So it's, it's, more, it's more of a story about diversification than it is about not being in, in the market. And that's, that's what... Uh, Larry Swedro gave us such a good answer to that question when he was a guest on our podcast a while ago, the first time that he was a guest. He's been on, he's been on twice. Um, but we asked him that question that uh, p some, sometimes people tell us that they, they don't have time to wait for factor premiums. And Larry says, no, that's absolutely backwards. You need more sources of expected return. The shorter your time horizon is, not the other way around. Uh, it, we're, we're, we're faced with risk in investing. We, people talk about risk a lot, but risk risk can be quantified with known probabilities, and that's probably not even the best description of risk in financial markets because there's there's a lot of uncertainty as well. Um, but maybe it it generally investing in like a global index tilts us a little bit more toward risk than uncertainty, especially if you own the whole the whole market. Uncertainty cannot be quantified. I think political risk and war are more uncertainty than they are risk. You can't really plan for that kind of thing with mm -hmm. asset allocation. Um, in, in Neil Ferguson's paper, the, the title of the paper is Earning from History, Financial Markets and the Approach of World Wars. It's the paper that I mentioned a couple of times. Uh, Neil Ferguson finds, kind of the, similar to the quote I mentioned earlier, the changes in military technology and government regulation ensure that one could never be certain that the next war would have the same financial impact as the previous war. So again, it's kind of like, can you use the, uh, the onset of a war to time the market? No, because they're always different. But that doesn't mean that there are no lessons to be taken from history. I thought this was very interesting. This is Neil Ferguson's commentary. Uh, his, his big three lessons that he gives at the end of his paper are that major wars can arise even when economic globalization is far advanced. The longer the world goes without a major war, the harder one becomes to imagine. I think people can probably relate mm. to that now. And when a crisis strikes complacent investors, it causes much more disruption than when it strikes battle-scarred ones. Mm. And that's his observation, looking at the behavior of investors from in World War One, World War Two, and the, the Korean War, uh, maybe the Cold War too. He looked at all those different events. Uh, Keynes, and this, I, I, this is a quote from Keynes, but I found it in Neil's um, paper. In 1937, Keynes wrote about how to respond to uncertainty, the, the non-quantifiable uh, type of uh, risk. Uh, and this is in 1937, so the years before the 
Second World War. Kane said, we largely ignore the prospect of future changes about the actual character of which we know nothing. You can't predict the future. We assume that the existing state of opinion as expressed in prices and the character of, of existing output is based on a correct summing of future prospects. Knowing that our own individual judgment is worthless, we endeavor to fall back on the judgment of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. That is, we endeavor to conform to the behavior of the majority or the average. I don't know, that sounds like, uh, sounds like index funds to me. Um, but you take what Neil said and, and what Keynes wrote. Um, it's it's kind of like you t take as much risk as you can, only as much risk as you can handle. Um, and, and as much risk as you can handle even in bad times or especially in, in bad times. But then the other piece of that is don't forget the bad times will come. Like exactly. you do your asset allocation, you do your financial plan, and we do this using Monte Carlo simulation and we do it using conservative expected return assumptions, but you can't forget the bad times will come. All you can do is plan for them. And when the bad times do come, you, you know that you plan for them and therefore you can keep your head down and, and diversify and, and you can't time the market. So, um, you, you just, you, you keep your head down and continue doing what your plan dictated that you should be doing. To meet the and that was the objective. That was a big revelation that Dave Getch had that he talked about with us when he was on at the beginning of the pandemic with uh, Dr. Summers. Yeah, that's right. Was, once he realized, learned to embrace volatility and, like you said, hug volatility. And once he had that mindset shift, he was able to withstand these inevitable episodes. Yep. So anyway, I, I hope our commentary has helped a little bit because I'm. I know some people are, are nervous because we've gotten some phone calls and emails and I've had some conversations. So I don't think it's just, uh, it's not us feeling nervous and wanting to do this. I think we're responding to, um, to how other people might be feeling. I also wanted to give a couple notes on, uh, on what Dimensional is doing. They gave us a, a briefing on how they're thinking about and handling the situation. And I thought they had some really insightful points. So Dimensional, it, it, the, the kind of theme of their talk was, um, they didn't say this, but it's what I took away from it. Risk management happens before a crisis. Well, it's kind of like what I just said with asset allocation, with planning. Risk management happens before a crisis, not after. So when not you ask sure. Dimensional, exactly. what, what are you what are you doing to, to respond to this? The, the answer effectively, and I'll, I'll say what they actually said, but the answer is effectively, oh, well, we already did it. <laughs> the risk management happened before the risk showed up, which is exactly how it should be. Um, so they, they decide whether to enter a market and particularly an emerging market uh, based on things like the costs and frictions associated with accessing the market, the liquidity of the market, uh, the level of regulation in the market, um, the and and in the at the individual exchanges in the country, the listing requirements of the exchanges, the accounting standards in the in the country, uh, the property rights, and the treatment of foreign investors. So those are some of the big things that, and there are likely more, but those are the big things that Dimensional looks at to decide should we enter this country? Uh, now, Russia, uh, according to Dimensional, has relatively lax listing standards. So Dimensional said, okay, we're not going to go direct onto the St. Petersburg or whatever the stock exchange is uh, and buy securities. We're going to go through ADRs. So those are American depository uh, receipts. And those are listed, and the ones that Dimensional owns are listed on the London uh, and US stock exchanges. So that means that the ADRs uh, have to meet US and UK listing standards, not the emerging market countries that they're uh, originated from or that the ADRs are representative of. So that, that makes that go away. Dimensional doesn't need to buy rubles to manage their positions in Russian stocks because they're transacting on uh, US and UK exchanges. So that makes some of that go away. Now, the other, the other thing that I thought was really interesting about their talk, and I didn't know this prior to hearing it, um, is that their, their weight in Russian securities is small relative to cap weights. So in the benchmark like ETF portfolios, and I looked at Vanguard's and iShares um, emerging markets portfolios, they're at 25 to 3% in, in Russia. Dimensional in 2014 decreased strategically decreased, not based on a prediction, not we think Russia is going to underperform, but they decreased the weight due to concerns about property rights. And they did that underweight in 2013. So it's been one, one to 1.5% 1 
in Russian securities in dimensionals emerging market strategies since uh, since 2014. But like I said, I checked Vanguard and and iShares. They are indeed still at 2.5 and and 3%. I can't remember which one was 2.5 and which one was 3. Um, but anyway, so dimensionals underweight relative to cap weights. And again, that's back to my comment of when when do you do risk management before a crisis happens? So they they did that. Uh, and they also said that they are currently evaluating sanctions and that may result in further changing their exposure to Russia. But their other big comment was like, this situation is not good. Um, we're, we're monitoring it closely, but at the end of the day, it is a relatively small allocation in the emerging markets portfolio, which is a relatively small allocation in the, um, overall global portfolio. So I, I didn't look at the percentage of the total portfolio, but 1.5% of the emerging markets portfolio is going to be well under a percent in the, uh, in the global portfolio. So anyway, I thought that was just, just insightful, but it's back to the general concept of managing risk before, before a crisis. So for me, the two key takeaways, one is that manage risk ahead of time and markets have volatile periods outside of wartime. The, the most, the, the biggest drops in global markets have been outside of wartime. They've been in peacetime. War does increase volatility. It is associated with negative returns on average, but not always and not in all countries. Yep. So you can't really use it to time, to time the market. But then the other big piece of this is that, I mean, the global market has been remarkably resilient despite all the crazy stuff that we've yep. seen throughout, uh, throughout history or well, for the last 121 years anyway. Good information. All right. Yeah. So that's, that's it. I hope it's, uh, I hope it's helpful for people. It was definitely helpful for me to go dig through all of that, all of that data. I, I learned a few things like the point about the biggest market crashes being in peacetime as opposed to during, during wars. I thought that was a interesting takeaway. Likewise with uh, St. Petersburg stock exchange outperforming the U S from 1865 uh, to, to 1917. That was another, another new one for me. So anyway, we, we hope this has been helpful. Exactly. Thanks. <laughs>